This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish. Welcome to the show and what a show we have for you. This is the second of a brand new series making its way to the airwaves for yo. This right now is the horror head-to-head. The sort of hair bane screen that could only be conceived by a man who drinks too much and spends too much time alone with his spreadsheets. Always with his spreadsheets. Uh, the premise of this is very, very simple. I pick 10 directors. Um, I put all their movies in a random number generator. And then for each director, two movies were drawn. Which means you don't, like, we're not doing Wes Craven and talking about Scream, for example, or Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, like the heavy hitters. There could be a chance here that we could be talking about Swamp Thing. Um, so you're like, <laughs> there's those moments where maybe the, the movies that aren't as good as the top ones make their way through. I have invited a plethora of phenomenal voices and talent to join me on this series. And each one of the five planned episodes that will be dropping over the summer will feature one of those voices representing one of those directors and one of those movies. This is episode number two. And due to the weird draw that we had, very much like episode one, uh, we have a double bill for a single director. The movies that will be discussed on this episode are two from author turned director Clive Barker. We'll be discussing Nightbreed and Lord of Illusions. We will be discussing Ken Russell with The Fall of the Louse of Usher. And then last but not least, we will be doing a, a little bit of Asian horror by one of the, the forefathers of the genre himself, Kuroshi Kurosawa specifically the modern new wave and we'll be do- looking at his movie creepy joining me on this episode oh my god i'm spoiled i'm absolutely in fact i'm spoiled you're spoiled we're all spoiled let me introduce these hosts one at a time joining me first let's introduce david garrett jr a longtime collaborator with this show and general all-round awesome guy hi david how's it going uh, it's going good how about yourself i mean could i be any happier right now? <laughs> the answer to that question is no no, David, I could not. So, <laughs> um, let the listeners know um, what you do in podcast land and where they can check out. Yeah, um, my main show that I do is Journey with a Cinephile, a horror movie podcast, and kind of following in the same vein as other shows have been doing. Anytime I kind of do a bonus episode that I actually do the editing or anything like that, it all falls under that because I do have. Another like side show that I do with a buddy of mine who he's into kind of genre movies, but we have kind of different tastes that we had growing up. Mm. So I will kind of, since I listen to way more podcasts than he does, I will, you know, kind of bring more stuff there, but everything is under that. And then also do written reviews that I kind of all keep on my site together. Just keep everything concise. Phenomenal. Welcome to the show. Now, David, you will be representing the movie Lord of Illusions by Clive Barker, so we'll get your thoughts and your scoring on that later on. Uh, My second guest needs no introduction, but I'm going to have to do it anyway, because that's how audio formats work. Um, She led the charge with some, I'm going to say controversial, but just, she justified them, uh, views on the previous episode, the previous installment. Um, Joining us is the powerhouse of the podcast genre. It is one Miss Lacey Lou, how you doing, Lacey? What up, Duncan? <laughs> how you doing? Uh, well, um, this these films were torture. <laughs> um, I'm like, looking at your scores, and I don't know if I agree with that. Well, well, look at the one. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's one on here that we're going to get to. Don't worry, we're going to get to. <laughs> um, yes, that, that 
this was it was a bit torturous. I was I did not have any cannabis infused drinks while watching these ones. So. Yeah, well, as, as yeah, like <laughs> you were drinking though, or hungover, hungover. You I said. was hungover watching two of them, which made one completely unbearable. <laughs> so. At least, what uh, what podcast do you represent? Uh, I represent uh, the Cut to the Chase podcast, along with the Solar Party Massacre, The Last 20, and Skip to the Loo. Phenomenal. Thank you. I am looking forward to hearing your views on a movie that you had never seen before as well. There's going to be a few of these, I think, throughout this uh, particular recording, but you did Kuroshi Kurosawa's Creepy which you will be leading the, the the drive on. Now, joining us on this, I'm super excited for this because I love getting new voices on the podcast under the stairs. Uh, there was a time that there was so many voices wanting to come on podcast under the stairs, and I feel like uh, my views and my general disposition has scared away everyone. And only people that have been on this show want to come back on this show, and it's very difficult to get new voices on here. But here is a new voice right now, ladies and gents. He's not up complete new voice and that he has led his views towards the summer series in the past as an adjudicator but joining me on this episode uh, representing the the director Clyde Barker and his movie Nightbreed uh, is one Mr. Tyler how do you pronounce your surname so I can never get it wrong again? Tadeo. Tadeo is what I've been saying I know yeah. there's no evidence of that like at all no, most saying. people most people can't do it when um I, I have to give my name on the phone a lot for like an email <laughs> address and I never say it. I just like I just per, I just spell it out every time. But yeah, I don't yeah. I don't use the regular like phonics, like I don't even know what they are. So I'm like T as in tiger, A as in <laughs> apple. I just make up my own words. <laughs> D as in demolition. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I like it. I like you like keep them on their toes. Um, Tyler, welcome to the show. What podcast are you here representing? Uh, I'm here representing the 22 shots of moods and horror along with uh, my coach JP, who you heard or will have heard on a call out on a couple episodes at this point. Yep. Um, also representing the Vince, uh, the Sin Bin podcast. Uh, it's mm. a podcast we just started. It's only monthly. We did a, uh, we started at the beginning of the year uh, where we're, we're just um, covering the previous month's vinegar syndrome releases. And that one's a video cast as well. And going over like our picks and we do a group review and then an, an individual pick from all of us. And we do that. It's the same three of us from 22 shots, myself, JP and moods and our boy, Tony is also on there. And uh, that one's a lot of fun. I'm excited to keep going on that. Yeah, that it was. Um, I, I was completely unaware of that because I'm almost completely disconnected from the internet at this point. And he was explaining the format and the premise of it, uh, JP, on episode number one, and I was like genuinely excited. So um, I will be catching up with those in due course, my friend. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and taking. It's worth saying as well. You have at very last minute notice. Uh, jumped in to fill the void from the the clusterfuck that was trying to fill the gap um, because our buddy Florian uh, ended up in the hospital so could not be here to do some recording so thank you very much oh, glad, glad to be here thanks for having me I've been listening to the summer series way before I was involved in podcasting and I've always been like I wish I could be on this this would be so cool well, it's kind of awesome making it here yeah dude listen so the, this summer series will be returning next year and when it does if you're on one of these things you usually come back trust me everyone else has um so like once you're on the train it's difficult to get off the train let's put it that way um lastly joining us on this episode is also a, a voice that i worked this out um i like uh, like mike appeared on a podcast under the stairs episode back in 2013 uh, which was the year that this podcast started, where I interviewed him way back in the day and asked him what he did for Halloween, what what sort of celebrations, what sort of traditions did his household do. Uh, I think it was there about four years before we actually podcast together, but you were on that episode too. I feel like, Mike, you've been around since the start. Joining me, discussing uh, Ken Russell's The Fall of the Louse of Usher, which I know what you're thinking, I've never heard of that movie before. Maybe there's a reason for that. As the one phenomenal Mr. Mike Merriman. How you doing, Mike? Well, hello there, Duncan. Great to be here. It's Mike from No More Room in Hell, the uh, sometimes bi-monthly uh, podcast <laughs> where we're talking horror movies, news, and all the other good stuff. And then the one that we put out consistently, it's Fresh Cuts, talking new release horror 
theatrical when possible. If not, we uh, searched on VOD to find something. Completely different shows than what you were on when I interviewed you back in 2013, but it shows you that times have changed. I'll tell you what hasn't changed. Uh, the way we look at horror movies, or has it? We're going to find out on this episode because we have a couple of... Um, <laughs> we have a couple of pre-2000 horror movies here and then post-2000 horror movies. So we're going to find out if that has any impact on the quality. Um, and saying that, the reason I'm quite excited about the series overall is that I'm picking directors that, at some point in their career, have hit movies that we as genre fans, cinephiles, if you will, would see are some of the best that the genre has ever produced. But... The law of averages dictate that not every director is going to hit a home run. And we're going to find out which ones have slipped by the wayside on this episode. The way we're going to do this is by picking one individual to come forward into the docket and put forward their case to me, the supreme being of this show, and put forward a approximately five minute defense or evisceration of that movie uh we're also going to be scoring these based over the following five categories story acting effects soundtrack and kills at the end it's going to give us a total number out of a potential 50 per movie for each of these hosts which means by the end of this we'll be scoring all the movies out of a possible 200 points now i'm here in the background impartial if you will but i've also watched all the movies and scored them myself so in the unlikely event that we end up with a tie my points will come into effect i will let you know what i've scored the movies anyway because that's the fun of it but let's say uh, let's begin ladies and gentlemen by discussing the first movie on the docket so let's talk about Lord of Illusions. Uh, released in 1995, directed and written by Clive Barker. The DP on this one is Ron Schmidt, who did The Mist and The Walking Dead. And the score is done by Simon Boswell, who did Phenomena, Demons 2, Stage Fright, so a ton of Italian horror. He also did Santa Sangre, as well as, and this is a personal joy for myself, Hackers. Um, the cast of this movie, well, we have Scott Bakula, Kevin G. O'Connor, J. Trevor Edmund, Daniel Von Bargen, Josen Latimore, we have Sheila Towsey, Susan Trailer, we have Michael Angelo Stuno, and some other folks. Synopsis for this movie is a private detective gets more than he bargains for when he encounters Philip Swan, a performer whose amazing illusions captivate the world, but they're not really what everyone thinks. A little bit of the trivia on this movie composer Christopher Young, who scored Barker's Hellraiser in 1987 was initially brought on to work on this film, but he was replaced by Simon Boswell when the, po the film's post-production schedule was stretched out, making Young unavailable. The early first sheet has Young credited as a composer. This is based on Clive Barker's short story, The Last Illusion, which was published in 1985 in the anthology Books of Blood, Volume 6. Also, as the last bit of tidbit here, the final shot of the film uh, Harry and Dorothea look out into the desert. This is an homage to the film shot in Filchies Beyond. So there we go for that. So the podcast Under the Stairs calls forth one Mr. David Garrett Jr. He is going to stand before us and he's going to present his case for or against the movie Lord of Illusions. David, if you'd like to, to step up, please, and um, <clears throat> make your case. <coughs> Yeah, would love to. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I would say here that Lord of Illusions. Now, I will give credit here to Clive Barker is that we have some good elements to this one. The problem here is kind of the issue that he ends up getting out of filmmaking is I believe the studio was interfering with him. So I don't want that to reflect on what he wanted to do here. And I think what we get with this movie is an interesting blend of kind of a neo-noir, but you're also mixing in, you know, magic and the supernatural here. Now, one thing I can't necessarily defend here is I'm not a big Scott Bakula fan. Don't necessarily know <laughs> if he is all that good in this movie, but I do think we have a solid cast around him. I do think Kevin J. O'Connor is pretty solid in what he's doing here. And then I would actually say that Nix, who we need more of in this movie, to actually make this better outside of the fact that he does go comic book with his ways of what he's trying to do here with his powers and kind of what his end game is. That is something I think needed a little bit better of, but Daniel Von Bargen 
was solid as that character. And like I said, mm. something that we needed a little bit more of there. Outside of that, though, I do love the investigation that we get with this movie. I think there's some good stuff there where we are in that typical noir fashion where you get one clue and then that leads you to the next one. And then that kind of goes to the next thing. I think that they, when you're not using CGI in this movie, there is some pretty decent effects here. Again, going back to Nick's, I think when we finally see him near the end of the movie, that's where we get some good stuff there with them. But yeah, this is a movie that is in that sweet spot where they try to do some stuff with CGI that just does not hold up and does not look good in the least bit. Kind of going along with that here. I think that also what hurts the kills here is that we do a lot of stuff off screen. I think we need to do some more on and when we actually do, I think those are pretty halfway decent as well. So kind of the only thing that I would kind of just end this little, I guess, rant that I'm doing here in favor of this movie is that Developing more of the magic, I think, would what also would help benefit this one. I do like the concept here that when Swan is doing what is kind of considered this last illusion here that he's going to do before he, you know, sails off into the sunset, his plan also is a little bit misguided here, thinking that he's going to be able to do this and get away. I think we kind of lean a little bit more into that, especially when they go to this like museum or this like building where they have all of the records and everything. Doing a little bit more there or kind of fleshing out more of the stuff. And then the last thing, I guess, also, is exploring this idea more of this exercise boy that is haunting the Demore character. I think he introduced that and then it goes nowhere outside of he has reoccurring nightmares. Doing a little bit more there, I think we also have a much better movie. Nice, nice. Let's talk about the scorecard. So we have story, acting, effects, soundtrack, and kills. Um, you're allowed to score this 1 through 10, 10 obviously being the maximum score you can give it, 1 being the the, the minimum. Um, what did you give this movie for story? I had give this one a 7 for story. You give a 7. Acting? I gave that a 7 as well. Uh, the effects? I gave this one a 6. And on the soundtrack? I actually enjoyed this one, but I gave it a 7. And lastly, the kills in the movie. I also gave this a six. Which means that your total out of 50 for this movie is E number 33. It's 33 for you. Thank you very much, David. I need you to stay here because we have some other uh, we have some other hosts that may want to cross-examine. We're going to work through in the order that they will appear on this episode to do their reviews so i'm gonna i'm gonna turn over to lacy lou lacy anything that you want to take umbrage with here anything that you're like no nah, david kind of got that wrong or do you want to be like good job david this is why good job david um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah you broke that down very eloquently um yeah this obviously is not like my favorite movie like i was excited because i like movies that involve magic and shit Mm. And, um, like, the best part is the, the magic show. Um, other than that, um, like, when he's like, it, and you could definitely play a drinking game for how many times they say, Swan! Um, <laughs> <laughs> You'd be, like, please tell me that's not how you ended up hungover watching movies the following day. If only. Was playing that drinking game, because that is deadly. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been, yes. Um, I, I, I wish I wish that I had now. If I ever have to watch it and endure this film again, I'm definitely drinking to it. Um, but um, the the part where he's like um, the PI is like, I mean, it has like such an interesting premise, but like it just failed on execution. Um, like, um, but the part that I thought was the funniest was when Schwann's like, I think it's Schwann, um, is holding up the car, and yeah. he's like. He could easily like just move out of the way, <laughs> like, and then it just like flies over his head. It's it's fucking ridiculous. Um, I mean, uh, but that's what makes like somewhat of these torturous movies fun is like really shitty moments like that that are fun to laugh at. Um, yeah. yeah, I just wish it had like, I, I mean, and you have Famika in this who, yes. um, oh. she looks like she's like so young, I'll, and all I could think about is her as the squid head from the faculty uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Josh Harnett goes, fuck this shit. Um, but, um, yeah, no, um, it was, it was, it was cool to see her, I guess. But um, yeah, other than that, um, it just felt like more or less of the same of like trying to be like Hellraiser, but a far superior 
or a far less superior version of that. Yeah, I, would like, I almost tricked you. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not going to be lie. I, like, I, I almost booted you from the call, but like, I'm glad that you then corrected that. I yes. was like, oh, don't do this to me. <laughs> like, no, like, it, it's like, it's just like torture shit. Like, I mean, people say that, like, um, you know, the Saw movies are like torture porn. Like, this is yeah. way more torture porn than any. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, Lord of the Demons. Like, can you please make me forget that I ever watched this fucking yeah. movie? This is, that this, is, this is patience porn because uh, it's, <laughs> it's stretching my patience. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, let's talk about your grades, though, because um, I can see why you said that David got this kind of right because. Your overall score isn't that far away from it. Let's talk about the story. What did you give it? Um, like I said, it the story, like the premise sounds great, but the execution failed. So for that I had to give it a six. Like the synopsis. So is cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's one below David. And um, what did you give the acting? Um, a six because Schwan is fucking terrible. You give that so that's one below uh, David as well. Uh, what did you give the effects? Oh god, I, I must have been high. Um, <laughs> because it should be much lower. Um, I gave it an eight. Um, you give it an eight, which is two above David. Um, yeah. so, soundtrack. A uh, six. It was you like this a... it was like stock music. Yeah, I don't know. So that's one below David, and lastly kills. I mean, that was probably like the best part. In that was uh, this is way too high. Like I was like I'm I think I'm like overly generous. I gave it an eight. I, I get the feeling that you felt that you were scoring it mean needlessly low, so you you kind of compensated at the end there. Um, so you gave it an eight, which means actually overall uh, there's only one point of the difference between you and David's score. You scored it one point higher. You gave it a thirty-four. Um, we are uh, thanking Lacey for her contribution here. Uh, however, we do need to turn our attention to Tyler, and I'm looking at your scores right now, Tyler. You did not have the same fun time that everyone else had watching this movie, so um, I, I imagine that you have a couple of things to pick up with David here, so uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, honestly, I'm pretty much uh, in the same park as David and Lacey. Um, I'm I'm a little bit of a harsh raider. That's something I've kind of been told. <laughs> so, I did maybe, not know that. I yeah, know that. so I like you might have it. to scale me for for a little bit because sometimes <laughs> I'll even be like on like a podcast. It's like, yeah, it was good. I liked all this stuff. But like, yeah, six out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> this is a perfect movie. I give it an eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's not too far off. <laughs> but yeah, so it, it it does suffer from kind of the uh the fall that. It, this movie actually does sound like really good on paper, and I'm just like a, ju a huge genre fan. I really love like that, like dirty, like LA noir stuff. So there had it, it with in some of my favorite horror is like non exorcist religious or like black magic type movies. Yeah. So there's a lot this really this movie had going for it. It's just this story is just it, the way it's executed and written is just so muddled and like incoherent. There's such a bell curve of acting where you get, like, you know, some decent performances here or there. But then you have, like, some of these side characters are just, like, ridiculous. And it's just... <laughs> Anybody it's, in the it's, cult it's, so Yeah, bad. like, <laughs> they're so bad. It's, like, it just, like, there's so many of, like, those performances and, like, sequences I remember where I'm, like, rolling my eyes. You're just, like... That uh, it makes you forget about like the more decent performances. Not that I like even think that anybody was like phenomenal in this movie. <laughs> like uh, the most, the most like value I got from some of them were like I've seen him before. Like oh, Nix is Lieutenant Spangler from Malcolm in the Middle. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so <laughs> and like even like Famke. I, I'm more of a fan of her a little bit later on when she got, like, a little bit more mature. So even in this, she was just, like, it could have been anyone. She was just fine for me in this. So, like, they, they kind of range from, like, it, these actors could have been anyone to really bad to fine. Mm -hmm. um, some of, like, the sets and, like, costumes and, like, effects were really cool. But then, like, it's the same thing, like, where you had stuff that is just, like, aged like milk. Yeah. And, like, I, I understand, like, that was just, like, the thing at the time. But I've out and, and I don't, like, mean to bang on, like, mo like dated movies like that. But a lot of the time, it's, like, you just, you don't have to put this in the movie. Like, you can put, you can do something else that you can do in your budget that's, like, practical. Like, you look at, like, Hitchcock movies, for example. And, like, the 
green screens that the guy liked to put in the back of the window of cars driving like still hold up and he didn't ever like try to do anything like ridiculous that like ended up aging like milk even though he had the technology to so that's just kind of an issue i take with it that way um but yeah either uh, pretty much every element i felt either had like the bell curve or there was real was really bad or like real or pretty good in some spots or it was just like kind of muted throughout like the soundtrack it was, it, it was fine it, it wasn't bad but it wasn't anything like anyone's gonna remember interesting let's talk about scores then so what did you give the story story i gave a four um and the reason i gave it a four is because i if i were to just look at like this this backstory like the description of the movie and that's it that sounds like something i would rate a lot higher but the writing is just like so bad and like making the story work with that already had a lot going for it that i kind of took the writing into the account um than just like the story at face value that's three below david what did you give acting Acting, I gave a four. I felt overall it was below average. <laughs> Three below, David. What did you give the effects? The effects, I gave a four. Same thing. It was just really bad on some spots, but it was good in some. But just, I'm going to remember, like, there there was nothing that impressive about it. Like, maybe some other movies mm-hmm. that outweigh, like, how bad the stuff I'm going to remember was. And that is two below, David. What did you give the soundtrack? Five. Perfectly average. Uh, that's two below David's. And lastly, what did you give kills? I gave the kills a five. They're, I think they about were about average. Again, like the the first kill was pretty good with the magician, and but there was also like you could have done something different here. Yeah, yeah, that's one below David, which means that you gave this movie out of fifty a twenty two. Um, thank you very much, Tyler. Lastly, coming up to do his cross examination is Mike. Mike, anything? I'm looking at your score. It's not hugely away from from David here. Anything that we bring up? All right, Lord of Illusions. Generally speaking, I think it's kind of a microcosm of Barker being realized on the screen, which is usually convoluted, messy, chock full of great ideas that aren't fully realized. I think you'll hear some similar thoughts on Barker's other movies since we <laughs> have the uh, coincidence of two uh, Barker movies in one episode. Uh, I think it's a modern miracle that everything came together for Hellraiser, a movie I like very much that somehow they found the right balance between the novel and the movie because there's tons of differences. Some people love to point out, uh, but they, they made it work. In this one, I would say a little less so, but we'll get into uh, some of the details with my scores. Awesome, Ro. Let's, let's jump right into those scores then. What did you give story? Uh, for the story, I said a six. I, I like the setup. I like the foundation set, but it just kind of knocks down to like your average as the movie goes on. Right, so that's one below what David gave it. What did you give the acting? Acting, kind of similar to story. Uh, I just don't think there's lots for the cast to work with. Scott Bakula, you know, he, he's Scott Bakula. I did love Famke Jensen. I always love her and everything. Uh, so I'll, another six. Right, and that's six. So that's one below what David gave it. What did you give the effects? It's definitely dated, Lenny 24 lens, but I try not to hold it. Uh, uh, responsible for the time. But even that said, they weren't that great. So another middling score of six. Six. So that is the same as what David gave it. What did you give the soundtrack? Uh, soundtrack? Uh, I didn't think... Once again, I can't go any above average, or like about average, so six there. Right, you give it a six, which is one below what David gave it. And lastly, what did you give the kills? The kills... Uh, I'm going to thin great, nothing terrible, a tiny bit of bridge maybe, I guess, so I'll give it a six. Right, six, so that is the same as David, which means out of a maximum of 50 points, you gave Lord of Illusions 30. Thank you very much, Mike. So, like looking along here, the highest person to score this movie was Lacey, which surprises me because the chat we were having offline was like, Lacey hates this movie. But she gave it a 34. Um, and next place was David with 33. Then was Mike with 30. And the the, the, harsh, the harsh scorer himself has struck. Uh, and Tyler, who gave us a 22. Um, so there we go. My scores, of course, revealed at the end. Um, thank you, Venom. David, you know what? 
you are now excused from the docket. You've done a good job, my friend, and uh, you now are free to sit down. And guess what? You now get to query other people, which is always a, a great feeling. So nice. thank you very much, David. You're now excused. Thank you. Right, ladies and gents, uh, let's keep this good time a rolling. So let me give you some information on the movie Creepy. Creepy was released in 2016. It is directed by Kuroshi Kurosawa. It is based on the novel by Yakuta Meikawa. This is going to be difficult, so stick with me. Who did the novel Chirio... <laughs> Chirio, which sounds like bye. Uh, Chirio Ikida and uh, adapted by Kuroshi Kurosawa. The DP on this one is Akiko Azao Ashizawa, who did Screaming Class, which is a great name for a movie, and also worked with uh, Kurosawa on Before We Vanish, which is the movie he did after this. The score is done by Yuri Habuka, who has done, in my comments here, loads of TV, so we'll not go further than that. The cast is is honestly the most difficult thing I've ever read in my entire life. Uh, Hitoshi... Nishiyama, Yuko Takauchi, Toro Baba, Ryoko Fujino. <laughs> uh, let's just leave it there. Those are the main cast members. The synopsis for this movie is Taka, Takakura is a former detective. He receives a request from an ex-colleague, Nogami, to examine a missing family's case that occurred six years earlier. I'm Scottish, so forgive me. Takakura follows Saki's memory um, and she is the only surviving member of uh, a, a case that is yet unsolved. Meanwhile, Takakura and his wife, Yasuko, <laughs> recently moved into a home. Why did they write it like this? Their neighbour, Nishio, has a sick wife and a young teen daughter. One day, the daughter, Nio, tells him and that... Th this is so horribly written and obviously transcribed from Japanese. Tells him that the man is not her father and she doesn't know him at all. There's only one bit of trivia, thank fuck. Uh, it says, the serial killer that the main character discusses with his class is Robert Hansen. He would kidnap prostitutes and take them in a plane into the forest where he would hunt them down and kill them. He lived in Alaska. That is awesome. Uh, Lacey Lou, you are uh, defending this movie or you are condemning this movie. So the floor is now yours. I believe this was a first time watch. So I'm very curious to hear how you got on with the movie Creepy. The floor is now yours. Oh, God. Okay. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Duncan, I have uh, uh, my review is all that, all that stuff that you just read out there because you should have known that from the last episode. And I'm like, yeah, I should have. <laughs> well, it goes with Sorry. my little written pre-speech here. I'm looking right. forward to it. Good morning, listeners and co host of the podcast. Today, I'm here to tell you about a film called Crepe. Our presiding <laughs> judge of the court... <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to put a pause on that. How did you pronounce that? Crepe. <laughs> <laughs> Our presiding judge of the court has already went into explicit detail of the cast and director, so I will not rehash. So, Someone has recorded an episode already. <laughs> it's actually quite hard to break down this movie with only one watch, as it starts as almost a police procedural, and then turns into something of the sorts of brainwashing. Like, what? Mm. I was left quite <laughs> confused. The profile aspect was cool but it shows that becoming obsessed will only get you into trouble. For a film called Crepe, it did not <laughs> creep me out at all. The guy, the so said Crepe guy, wasn't that fucking Crepe. The neighbor bitch coming through the window saying her dad wasn't her dad was the most intriguing part of this whole story, but I felt the outcome was less than to be desired. I cannot advocate for you to vote for this, as I've done a shit job explaining it. <laughs> <laughs> because as I stated, it left me fucking confused. Technically well made, but I was fucking lost, you guys. Seriously. As for the other films in the lineup, if you want a film that is a wannabe Hellraiser with some bad CGI fire and stop looking at me, Schwan, then choose Lord of Illusions. Or if you want a poorly made spoof of Fall of the House of Usher that has an inflatable fucking dinosaur fucking a blow up doll, we're go we're gonna get to it. We're gonna like <laughs> we're gonna get to it. <laughs> then choose Ken Russell's shit show 
fall of the House of Laos, which whatever the, like I think I said that wrong, which is not even horror, but horrible. <laughs> so by default, I implore you all to vote for Nightbreed because of Danny Elfman's score and the love story that is easy to follow into the underworld. Also, if you're a diehard One Tree Hill fan, then the decision is easy as fuck because Uncle fucking Keith plays Boone. That's all I got. Thank you. Hashtag spoiler. Um, what, what I did love about that entire review was neighbor bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the greatest description for a character ever. Like, I'm here to audition for the part of Neighbor Bitch. <laughs> neighbor Bitch, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it says in the description that I have to be crepe. Um, crepe. So, uh, like, everything there was just absolute gold. And let's talk about scores here, because you're saying that you're imploring people to watch Nightbreed, but the scores, the scores uh, indicate something a little bit different here. Lacey, let's talk about what you gave this story. It's an eight. <laughs> <laughs> you give the story an eight. Um, uh, that that is that's good to know. Uh, what did you give the acting? I mean, like it's hard to like really judge because like I've never seen any of these people before, or, you know. Um, and it didn't come off like camp or corny, so I gave him an eight. You gave it an eight. What did you give the effects? Um, there wasn't like a whole lot, I didn't think, so I just gave mm -hmm. it a seven. Yep, that feels safe. And um, what did you give the sim track? I mean, there wasn't really much, like, so it was more of like a score and sound. So, I mean, there wasn't anything wrong with it. Like, it, it, it was just eight. You give it an eight. And what did you give the kills? I mean, uh, an eight. <laughs> <laughs> that as well, which means that of a possible 50, you scored this 39. <laughs> like so. And I'm happy for it. Um, I, I get the feeling that even if you may have been marginally lost while watching it, your heart was in the right place when it came to putting the points. Yeah, the like, that, I mean, it changes things, like, because, like I said, it's going to take m more than a one-time watch for me to, like, oh, process everything on that. And I was hungover watching it, so, like, if you, like, look <laughs> away for, like, two minutes, like, you can miss a lot. And that probably happened, to be honest with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I tried. Right, I'm going to... I'm going to keep you there, though, because, as always, we get a chance to switch around other hosts and get their opinions. Uh, we're going to jump to the review of our first movie, actually, on this episode, uh, one Mr. David Garrett Jr. Anything that you want to um, reiterate as a point that um, Lacey has made that you agree with, or anything that you actually disagree with completely? It's actually kind of funny. Our scores, for the most part, are very similar, but I end mm. up really enjoying this movie, even though it does need... I end up watching this twice just because I had never seen it before. And I mean, I'm a big fan of this director and every movie by him I've seen, you really do have to watch these twice. So I will double down on that, that there is so much that he kind of just puts in here and it makes more sense the second time around. Right. Um, let's talk about scores then. So what did you give story? Um, I gave it an eight. Uh, my only issues Not there were there was just some things that... I think I needed a little bit more fleshed out, which, and there's other things I think should be trimmed up that would kind of help balance that out. I mean, that's spot on with what Lacey scored. What did you give the acting? Um, I also gave that one an eight. Which is spot on with Lacey scoring. What did you give the effects? <laughs> a seven. That was just spot on with Lacey scoring. <laughs> what did you give the soundtrack? Um, I gave this one a seven, just kind of like what they were doing with it. Even though it's not necessarily right. music. <laughs> uh you you have like given it like literally i mean i mean i'm looking at this and i'm, I'm looking across the like can as it's, it's not uncommon that i look at things and i i go like there's almost a completely similar viewing experience mm -hmm. which is unusual for a like a japanese horror movie things tend to go off the rails um in terms of the actual soundtrack itself i mean how do you think it actually aids or doesn't aid the movie for me, I just feel like it helps. It does set the atmosphere for things. Yeah. And I'm glad that it doesn't take me out of it, that I can kind of just get lost in the scenes. And cause I think if it would have been more out there, that would have actually hurt it. Right. So, I mean, your score was, let me see, your score for the seven track was seven. Yeah. yeah. Which is one below what Lacey gave it. So lastly, kills. The one thing I will give here is I gave it a five only because we don't really get a lot of them, but I didn't want to go below that just because they are shocking when we get them sometimes. Right. So you gave it a, f 
five, uh, which is three below what uh, Lacey gave it. But if we're looking at this here, overall, you gave this a 35 out of 50, which is overall four points lower than what Lacey gave it. Right. Um, thank you very much, you. David. Let's turn over to Tyler, the, who we're now finding it is a notoriously low scorer. I'm looking at these scores here, and I'm thinking you must have really liked this movie. Um, anything that you want to kind of come in on with what's been said already? Yeah. Uh, first, I'll just say I probably have a pretty big predisposition of bias towards this film. I'm actually <laughs> like a really big Japanese music, uh, I'm not music, uh, Japanese movie fan. Um, not just horror movies. I'm actually, like, really also into, like, the classical, like, Japanese movies of, like, Kurosawa, Kabayashi, like, Misaguchi, all those guys, Ozo. And this film, to me, is, it's, like, a modern version of, like, taking cues from, like, those classical directors into almost, like, this, like, new, like, neo-wave of Japanese horror movies. Mm -hmm. This movie feels like a blend between, like, a more traditional director today, like, horror, uh, like, Corita, like blend with like a Sion Sono, and I really like that. I definitely understand why um, this movie wouldn't have as strong as effect on people watching for because it is a very like methodically like slow paced movie. Uh, that's how like the majority of these movies are. So if it's not like a pace that you're like looking forward to or like maybe as used to as I might be, like uh, you you definitely might struggle with it a little bit. And there are like a lot of like character interactions and a lot of little subtle things and a lot of just like quiet spaces in between. But that's part of what I think is good about this movie. Um, I really like, like, there's, like, like the the look of it is just so traditional. Um, th like, you have a lot of, like, wide shots of, like, people, like, being in the center of the frame talking. And you get to, like, observe all the surroundings uh, around them. A lot of the time you'll see, like, conversations where someone walks to the center, like, of the frame. And then the camera glides from, like, the other angle. And then it just meets perfectly in the middle. Um, like the lack of music, it's more of the sound design. This there's a lots of like really nice scenes where you get really get like the whistle of the wind against the grass. You get you just get like you have all these things in the background, and when it takes its time like this and like gives you this big show, like this big view, it's almost like it's not really acting in like the traditional sense of like these other movies where it's just trying to like capture this like very naturalistic feel, and that's really what a lot of these of this Japanese style is about that I really enjoyed. Um, there is like a plot elm that is a little wonky. Uh, that, that, that is a little like, it, I, it works enough. Like it's not like awful enough to like, to like really like ruin the movie for me, but yeah, there could have been stronger writing there, but that's also like something that you do come across in like Japanese movies sometimes where it just, it's so out of pocket. <laughs> it's just kind of part of the culture. That's something yeah. that like, it's like when you get used to like Italian movies. Like, yeah, I know it's exaggerated and like super violent and all this, but like that's that's what the this is the style. Like that's what they yeah. like. So yeah, um, I'm just really into this type of movie, and I think it worked. It may have worked a little bit better for me than uh, some others. Very nice. Well, um, let's let's do a little bit of detail on your scoring for this movie. What did you score the story? I gave the story a seven. Right, so that's one below what David gave it. Um, what did you give the... Uh, sorry, what's one below what David gave it, one below what Lacey gave it. What did you give the acting? I gave the acting an eight. Um, also, with one of the actors, the, the main guy, uh, Hidetoshi Najima, he's actually like a really big modern Japanese actor right now. He was the star of that movie Drive My Car, that won Best Inter uh, yeah. International Picture two years ago, which is uh, also a great film. Yeah, so you are like, uh, so we have eights across the board for that. What did you give the effects? I give the effects an eight. There's not a whole lot of special effects, so like I really, um, but when they do do the, those things, they are impactful, and I kind of just tied into like, the, like the cinematography and what it was trying to achieve because I kind of view that as the same way as like effects. It was trying to set something. Mm -hmm. So you are, you're only like, so you're basically one above what Lacey scored. That I'm, I'm loving the consistency here. What what about the soundtrack? Soundtrack, I gave a seven. It's mostly sound design. It's very good, but it's not like anything outlandish or that, you know, it's like that memorable. Just good for the movie. So, same as David, one below what Lacey gave it. And lastly, kills. Uh, I gave kills a seven. Like David said, there's not many, but when they do happen, they're impactful and they're like the most grounded in reality and realistic. Lovely. So, there we go. That's one below what Lacey gave it and two above what um, David gave it, which means. Uh, out of a maximum 50 points, you gave this movie a 37. So there we go. 
So, right, let's turn over to Mike then. Mike, anything that you want to pick up with what has been mentioned thus far for Creepy? Uh, it was a creepily long time. Uh, it was a two-hour movie that <laughs> probably could, could have been 90 minutes if they cut out lots of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did find the main killer, I guess, to be creepy, though. I, I give it points for that. A lot of the interactions... Uh, he was having the emotional changes on a dime through the course of conversations. I, I did like that stuff. I did find that stuff actually pretty creepy. But man, was this movie long and drawn out. Uh, it, it it felt much longer than it needed to be. That was my main takeaway. But I was okay with like the story and how it progressed and how the characters interacted. Cool. Right, let's let's go through your scoring overall for the movie then. So what, Mike, did you give the story? All right, story actually was pretty high on eight. Uh, I I like serial killer movies. I like the mysteries. I like the interactions. So story, I was pretty high on. Yep, you gave that the same score as what Lacey gave it. What did you give the acting? Acting, I actually went higher because none of my issues with the movie were around the acting. I like I said, the main villain I thought was pretty great in his in his role where it's like, is he nice? Is he sinister? Is he a mix of both? And then we find out later in the movie. Awesome. So that's one above what Lacey gave it. What did you give the effects? So the with this one on the effects, I don't know if I was being too kind because there just wasn't like a ton. So it's like what we got was good. So I came in pretty high with an eight. That's the same as what uh, Tyler gave it, and one above what Lacey gave it. What did you give the soundtrack? Soundtrack, I was a little lower on. Like thinking, sometimes what I'll do with soundtracks, I think back after watching it, and it, it didn't really come off memorable to me. There's nothing, you know, I, I didn't recall like a ton of cues or just anything too impactful. So I was kind of low on that with the six. Very nice. So that is two below what Lacey gave it, but actually not too dissimilar to what um, both David and Tyler gave it. They only gave it one above what you did. Um, and lastly, Kills. Uh, kills, I thought I was a little amicable with that. I gave it a seven. What we got was good. Uh, not a ton memorable or impactful, but I thought what we got was decent. Yep, that's the same score as what Tyler gave it. It is three, sorry, two above what David gave it and one below what Lacey gave it, which means out of a total of 50 points, you gave a creepy 38. Um, if we're looking at top to bottom there, uh, Lacey scored at the highest at 39, then Mike at 38, Tyler at 37, and the low score from the movie overall was from David at 35. Uh, Lacey Lou, you have as always been professional and accommodating. Thank you very much for your time. If you'd like to step down from the docket, please. Thank you. Right, uh, let's keep this good time a rolling, rolling, rolling. Uh, we are moving on to Tyler. We're also turning our attention back to Nightbreed. Let me give you some information on this movie before we start this shindig. Uh, Nightbreed came out in 1990. It's, of course, written and directed by Clive Barker. Uh, the DP on this one is Robin Vigadon, who did Hellraiser's Part 1 and 2. And the score is, of course, Danny Elfman. The movie stars Craig Sheffer, David Cronenberg, Annie Bobby, Charles Heed, Hugh Quasher, uh, Hugh Ross. Uh, we have Doug Bradley, Catherine Chevalier. Malcolm Smith, Bob Sessions, Oliver Parker and some other folks in here as well. The synopsis for this movie is listed on the IMDb's as a troubled young man is drawn to a mythical place called Midian where there's a variety of friendly monsters friendly monsters, I love that friendly monsters, that's the problem with this movie uh, there's a variety of friendly monsters that are hiding from humanity. Meanwhile a sadistic serial killer is looking for a patsy. You know what he says when he's looking for that patsy? He says this. He's got a gun! Thank you. Um, <laughs> couldn't help myself, couldn't help myself. Uh, the trivia, the trivia for this movie. Clyde Barker has gone on record as saying that he felt that the distributor Fox and the financiers of Morgan Creek Productions never understood the film and simply cut the story to pieces so it would fit their idea of what the picture should have been. David Cronenberg wrote the script for Naked Lunch, which once again blows my mind, uh, in his spare time when he wasn't acting in this 1988 produced film. Mark Frost, he of Twin Peaks frame, uh, did an uncredited rewrite on this script, so everything always comes back to Twin Peaks. Uh, the podcast under the stairs at this time would like to call Tyler 
to the docket here to either defend or condemn the movie Nightbreed. Tyler, the floor is yours. Yeah, so we have Nightbreed, a pretty well-known uh, cult classic within the genre. Uh, and it definitely it, it definitely is for a good reason. Uh, it does a lot of it. This movie really, like, this movie's definitely a movie, like, more for horror fans. I definitely see, like, people looking in on the inside, just, like, seeing this, like, they're really not liking it. Um, the vision, the vision of this really, like, fits in with a lot of other things I've seen from Clive Barker, and I do, like, really, I do really respect the, the vision, uh, he created with this movie, uh, this idea of, like, this distinct race of monsters, uh, it's all really cool, and there's a lot you could do with it, so it has a lot going for it, and I think, really, like, right out of the gate, this movie comes out very strong, mm. and maybe even, like, the best for me. Um, I love some of like some of these monster designs. Uh, I love the I love the Cronenberg mask. I actually think Cronenberg gives the best performance in this movie. He's, he's fucking amazing in this movie. Yeah, he's definitely the most memorable for me. But he's like the one that really stuck out to you. Like man, like Days really like bring the heat. And he, he's like bar none my favorite horror director. So that's pretty cool to see. Um, I definitely do see, though, uh, Barker's frustration with this film uh, and working with the studio because it really does see, like, the best, other than, like, uh, like the Cronenberg, like, kind of face-off between him him and Boone, um, I definitely would say the monsters or the monsters in Midian is, like, the most compelling part. And it's also, like, the most, like, it has that sense of mysticism where you just, like, want to see, like, more of this world and, like, more and more about the, the lore of it. And I felt like we, like, it definitely did, like, veer away from giving us, like, that backstory and trying to make the monsters, like, kind of more, like, aggressive anti-heroes than what Barker had definitely uh, intended. And it does come off a little uneven, and I think it gets, like, a little muddled, too, when they start bringing, like, Boone's girlfriend into it. Like, some of that <laughs> just, like, it just felt like, a, it felt like a movie trying to, like, compromise itself to be, like, restructured to fit, like, yeah. what was supposed to be more of a traditional like monster movie at the time, but uh, there's definitely still a lot that bleeds through and uh, it gets a little bit overwrought and messy, but it's like, it's also that same argument. It's like, yeah, I know it is, but I like what it's doing. This is like, I like what it's doing. I don't care if it is. And it still definitely works. Uh, it's definitely a movie that any, any genre fan should see. Um, but, like the set designs and the costumes are like my favorite, like or my favorite thing about it. Some of the effects are a little dated, but uh, the the design of it really holds up, uh, and that's really cool. Uh, some of the monsters are great. Some are a little, little bit not as great as others, but there's nothing that like sticks out to me as like bad in this movie at all. Um, it's got uh, the soundtrack is it's a little, is pretty good, is pretty memorable. This is definitely the most memorable of like the traditional soundtracks of any of these movies. Mm -hmm. I felt like maybe the sound design of this might have been a little worse than some of the other ones, but like that like. That almost like that Clive Barker like almost Hellraiser light like like that humming that like plays into the store is great like you just that that's something that just that'll stay in your head for weeks after you watch it and something like you'll always hear and be like oh that's the score from Nightbreed so that that part of it was really cool um, yeah overall it's it just it's a pretty I think it's not like I don't think it's like a masterpiece or like this like this movie i'd really prop up like too high in terms but it's definitely like an enjoyable movie it's a cool movie it's like not everything has to be incredible yeah i, I think i think that's fair to say overall let's talk about your scores and let's see if they reflect your statement there uh what did you give the story so the story i gave a seven really cool setup but i felt like the writing uh left a little bit to desire and actually executing it yeah like i don't know if, if has anyone else ever read cabal the the novella that it's based on yeah, I read it a few years ago. Yeah, it's relatively, it's not a long story at mm -hmm. all. And it's it, like, you can see where the pivot is here from, oh no, the monsters are supposed to be the bad things. Right. And you're like, when you read the book, that's not how the book is at all. <laughs> <laughs> the book is like leaning very much the other way around. So that's kind of funny to see how they've done things in there. Um, right, let's talk about acting then. What did you give acting? Acting, I gave a six. Um, I didn't think anybody in this movie was bad. I thought the majority of the people were fought, were like fine to good, and then Cronenberg was, was the standout for me, for sure. Right. Uh, let's talk about the effects. Effects, I gave an eight. 
Um, that's mainly based on the strength of like the the makeup, like the the designs, because I felt like that was more important. But there are some good, like some pretty good uh, effects kill wise too. Some effects that didn't age as well, but overall, I think what's they do really well with what's most important. Cool soundtrack. Soundtrack. I gave a six. Maybe I would have gave that a seven on second thought. Um, it's more, it's memorable, but I, I did feel like sometimes it was misplaced and I felt like, um, a lot of the sound got kind of messy when, um, we got to the last act and it kind of got into an action movie. Right. And lastly, kills and kills. Uh, I also gave a six, uh, some pretty good ones, some kind of iffy ones, but overall pretty good. Awesome, which means that of a maximum of 50 points, you gave this a total of 33. Uh, let's open the floor up, though. Um, let's go to David first. Um, anything that you want to pick up on that's been mentioned already? I mean, for me, it's going to be just doubling down, because I do agree with pretty much everything Tyler was saying there. It's pretty spot on to what you know I kind of had. I do think Cronenberg is the best performance in this movie. Another one that's kind of interesting being a Barker film where I don't love the lead in it mm. with everything they do acting wise. I don't think he's bad, but I also just kind of feel like he gets lost with kind of some of the people around him being just better characters in general. And that comes a lot of it with the monsters where like you see them and I just want to know more about them, which is why Anytime I've ever heard people talk about how this should be like a TV series would be just phenomenal. Yeah. And kind of what you're going back with talking about the book, it, it is so interesting how it is a novella, but then in this movie, they introduce so much where you're like, there's such rich mythology here. Like, how did you only do like a novella for this? Yeah, it's world building all the way through it. It's like he's, right. caught, it's like he's finally found the medium in which he can build this out to such exactly. a huge level. And of course infamously the movie was cut then further cut then <laughs> right. we've got a director's <laughs> cut we've got a cabal cut we've got all that like none of them i think are how he envisaged the movie and to be honest i mean the, the promise of a sequel that we never got although in saying that i don't know it maybe speaks to his uh presumption that he was always going to get that sequel when a movie like mm. this was always going to be difficult to pitch in 1990 right so Oh, the other thing that I would kind of end out here then before getting over to my scores is that I do love with the like Decker character, that mask is yeah. just phenomenal. <laughs> and I love how you like are mixing in this monster film, like a slasher film yep. where he is going around and killing these people with the dreams that he's being told about. And then just being like, then gaslighting this guy to the point where it's like, no man, you're the one doing these and just creating that whole scapegoat idea. Right. Let's talk about your scores then for Nightbreed overall. What did you give the story? Um, I gave this one an eight just because of there's so much there's problems with what we get and like again a lot of that probably studio interference but just some of the stuff is just so interesting and the little bits that we do get to learn about just makes me want more so that's why I couldn't go like much higher than that but I still think there's good elements to it so that is essentially only one above what Tyler gave it what did you give the acting um, I gave the acting a six just because none of the monsters are bad. Some of the like more characters are kind of caricature type people mm. where I couldn't go too much higher from it. But Cronenberg definitely made sure that I was not going to go below a six. Nice. Right. So that is spot on with what um, Tyler gave it. What about the effects? I gave this one a seven. There's some of the, like I said, some of those slasher kills that we get with him is great. And then the monster stuff, there's a little bit that might get a little bit wonky as you go on, but seeing each one of them and how distinct they are is just great. Awesome. Right. So, I mean, that's, once again, it's not that far off here from what we have. So it's just like one below. Soundtrack? Uh, the soundtrack, this one I gave a seven to as well. I think it's pretty good with where, how they have music for the most part. And I do love like the main theme that we get here. I thought that was pretty spot on. Wicked like Danny Elfman, so I mean, what would it right. be? <laughs> so that's one above. And lastly, kills. Uh, the kills, when we get the see the things that we get, I think that's good. So I gave this one a seven. There's just some parts of it where I'm like, man, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more with what you're doing here. And that goes a lot back to like the monsters and what their abilities and powers could be. But like I said, what we got to see was still solid. So a seven. Wicked, right? So overall. Um, you gave this movie 35 out of a possible 50. So scoring two points higher than what Tyler scored the movie. So there we go. 
So let's uh, kick this over to Lacey Lou. Anything that you want to bring up? Any Anything that's been mentioned that you disagree with or anything that you want to double down on? I mean, how dare you talk <laughs> shit about Uncle Keith from One Tree Hill? Uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I do understand what they mean, though. Um, like, the other creature designs were a lot better, in my opinion, than what they gave him. It looked like some, like, tribal yeah. shit going on his face. Um, yeah, th- like, I feel like they kind of did make him, like, an afterthought. But um, I thought the weak link was the, the female lead. I mean, she wasn't a band, like, but she's going to go to the uh, underworld just to go be with tribal face. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, I actually really liked the love story aspect of going to the underworld and, you know, she's because his body just fucking disappeared. So um, she goes to find him. But the end scene to where she just fucking like stabs herself like once and then is like dying. Mm. Like, it, it's just like that That was terrible acting. But I mean, like, I like the idea but I just feel like she was a poor actress, in yeah. my opinion. Um, if they had had a better female lead, um, I think this movie would have been a lot more effective. But um, I really do like the premise of the love story. I don't like the the monster stuff. But it's it's fine. But the love story was what intrigued me because I'm mad emo. And with Elfman <laughs> score, like, yeah. So um, this was the most entertaining watch for me out of um, the other three films. So... I yeah. find that hard to believe with a uh, Ken Russell movie on the, on the. <laughs> I'm only joking. I wanted only, to kill myself. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Uh, right, let's let's talk your scores then. Um, what did you give Story for Nightbreed? Um, like I said, I I like the love story aspect. So for that alone, I gave it a nine. That is two above what Tyler gave it. What did you give the acting? Ugh. <laughs> The worst part, um, six. That's uh, so across the board thus far. Everyone's given it sixes. Uh, what did you give the effects? Um, it was fine. They could have been a little better at times. Um, I gave it an eight. That's the same as what Tyler gave it. What did you give the soundtrack? Well, it's Elfman, not his best, but I feel like it really did enhance the movie with his score. So I gave it a nine. You give it a nine, so that is three above what Tyler gave it. And lastly, the kills. Eh, <laughs> mid seven. So that's the same as what David gave it. One above what Tyler gave it, which means that of a possible 50, you give this movie a 39. Uh, which brings us to our last commentator on this uh, movie. Um, Mike, anything that you want to pick up? Anything that you want to reiterate? I know you've already mentioned your last, which means that a lot of the points have already been made, but anything anything that's been missed out thus far? I mean, studios really seem to love Clive Barker's ideas, but just not the way he wants to realize them on the screen. Cause... They want to give him money, but they don't want to see what he does, which is weird. Yeah, I, I, I feel like in Nightbreed's case, even more so than Lord of Illusions, there, there's something there. And when you're watching it, it's like there's this expansive world that's trying to be created. There's lots of ideas trying to be thrown on screen, but whether it's due to studio interference or just the difficulty of adapting the mind of Clive Barker to the screen, it just doesn't quite all come together as much as you want it to because the positive aspects of the movie, I think keep you kind of entertained on some level and you want to see where this is going. Just unfortunately it doesn't go places you might be hoping. And I I know there's some people that are champions of this movie, and I'm kind of fortunate that it seems like everyone on this particular show seems to be somewhat similarly minded, because I was afraid I was going to make some enemies (laughs) with my thoughts on Nightbreed, but it sounds like we're all kind of on a similar page. Awesome, right? So let's, uh, let's run through your scores then and see how close or far off you were with them overall. What did you give the story? I give the story a six because I feel like foundationally it was there, but it just kind of came a little, became a little convoluted and um, messy a little bit. So that's one below what Tyler gave it. What did you give the acting? Acting, I want to notch up because again, sometimes because of the script, I don't necessarily blame the acting itself. Mm. I, I didn't think it was excellent, but I didn't think it was terrible either. Right, so you gave that a 7, which is 1 above what Tyler gave it. Uh, effects? 
effects is probably the high point in this just because of creature design yeah i, I like i like the looks i like the variety that we get and i only have to think in another case we were probably would have got even more if it wasn't for the studios mm. so i gave that an eight an eight which is the same as tyler the same as lacy one above what david gave it uh let's talk about elfman's score what did you give it uh, I came in a little low on that one with a six. Not, it, not bad, but not memorable. Like when you think Elfman, there's certain soundtracks that like pop into your mind as like like ideal or f- like ones that you'll never forget. That as Elfman in this one, it just can't quite hit that tier. Yep, six, which is the same as what Tyler gave it. And then lastly, on the kills, kills. I mean, nothing, nothing special, nothing much there. So I gave it a six. Which is the same as Tyler as well, which means that of a possible, a possible 50 points, you as well as Tyler gave this a score of 33. Which means if we look at overall, Lacey comes in with 39 at the top, David comes in 35 in second, and then joint third is Tyler and Mike. Uh, at this stage, I want to thank Tyler for his, uh, his case that he's been put forward in front of the court. Uh, Tyler, you are now excused, you may step down. <sighs> Thank goodness. Yep, um, all that is left to say is... He's got a gun! There we are. Um, thanks for much. Right, it's the final movie of the, the, the show, and we have saved the best. Oh, yes, we've saved the best for last. Um, let me give you some information on this final movie that Mike Merriman will be, uh, because of fate... <laughs> the crow mistress is uh, is talking about here. It is the fall of the louse of Usher from two thousand and two. This is directed by Ken Russell. You may be sitting there thinking to yourself, Ken who? Ken Russell, the guy that did the Devils, <laughs> a layer of the white worm. Anyone? Um, this is based. I love IMDb. It's like based on Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe would turn over his fucking grave. <laughs> His name was credited to this, uh, and name only. Uh, and it also does say uncredited, which is, I think is why Poe would like it. Um, but is primarily written by Ken Russell, who was also DP on this, so he is all over this with a keen eye. Uh, the score here is done by James Johnson, who literally has done very little in the way of scoring, apart from a movie called The Most Fertile Man in Ireland, which I imagine is also just a movie about shagging. Um, the cast here is James James Johnson, who's in the lead role here of the movie. So you get the you get the feeling. Wrote the songs and was like, can I be in the movie performing the songs? And Ken was like, yes. Uh, Elias Tribble Russell is also in the movie. Marie Finley. Ken Russell himself, that's right, he's in this movie as Dr. Caligari. Because why not? Uh, Leslie Nunnerly, uh, Emma Millions, uh, Pete Maston, Sandra Scott. This is the thing that tickled me pink. Like, honestly. There is an actor in this movie called Barry Lowe. Now, there are some people out there that are like, why would that tickle Duncan Pink? Um, the Baz, who famously appears on this show. His name is actually Barry Lowe, spelt exactly the same way. And I, he's on holiday at the moment, so I can't wait till he comes back until I throw these facts at him. Dear God almighty. I almost messaged you to be like, wait, is, is he, he in this? In this did, like, he did he star in this you? movie? <laughs> like, uh, is, is this what he was doing before he was doing your show? Yes. Let, let's just start that rumour. Yes, the Baz is in this movie. Um, and let's see if he listens to the show to pick it up. Uh, the synopsis for this one is rock star Roddy Usher's wife is murdered and Rod is sent to the lunatic asylum in this gothic slash comedy slash horror slash musical which I'm, in, I'm I'm sure that Lacey's listened to that bit. They went, nope, 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 and nope. Um, the trivia for this movie is it's shot on camcorder. Bet you didn't know that. Um, and director Ken Russell's slash garage studio with a cast made up of friends and neighbours. That's right, his neighbours just dragged him. Um... I, that was literally the only factoid on IMDb, so I went to Wikipedia to pull this one here. The Fall of the Louse of Usher features many of Russell's trademarks, including sexuality in brackets, often taken to extremes, such as showing an inflatable doll orgy sequence, uh, musical sequences, and over-the-top acting. The film incorporates musical and comedy elements, with scenes exaggerating the cheapness of the props, deci- despite primarily being a horror movie. Uh, The podcast Under the Stairs calls one Mr. Mike Merriman, um, who is going to lead the case for or against the fall of the Louse of Usher. Mike, the floor is yours. 
McLeish, I want to enter a plea of temporary insanity for the of the Laos of Usher, <laughs> a gothic tale for the 21st century. You mentioned Edgar Allan Poe is uncredited. I think he would prefer to be unmentioned as well. Like Ken Russell, I've been a fan of some of your stuff in the past. What the hell were you thinking here? No, uh, no more scary than it is funny. The credit I can give to this movie is that at least watching it itself looks like they had a fun time making it. Like, I feel like they would probably have to cut several times due to laughter. Uh, you have to be probably a big fan of like low budget experimental film to even kind of enjoy on some level. Uh, I think if, if I would put it in one category, it'd be more comedic than horror at all. But even then, it's going to be everybody's cup of tea of comedy. Uh, I read one that said it was a mix of several different uh, Edgar Allan Poe stories. I'd like someone to list those off to me. Yeah, so then we have blow up doll sex. And if everything I said leading up to that didn't get you excited for the movie, hopefully that will. And also blow up a uh, bounce house castle at the end, <laughs> which is the reward for escaping the asylum, I suppose. So I'll leave it at that. There's more that could be said, but is it really necessary? I think not. Right, so let's talk about your scores then, Mike, because like you sounded like you eviscerated that pretty strongly there. However, I'm looking at your scores and you may be a little bit kinder there. So what were you giving the story for this? <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at my scores too. Like, man, I was a little kind. So, <laughs> I gave it a five just because I guess I could follow it. So mm. it gets credit for that, for, <laughs> for being able to somewhat follow it. Um, acting? Oh, man, another <laughs> kind gesture by me, giving it a five. I mean, five, is it really a good score? No. Are these, like, professional? I don't even know if there's a professional actor in this cast, so maybe <laughs> I was being too amicable. <laughs> or you were thinking that there's not a professional actor in here and they're actually doing okay. Uh, so, I don't know. Maybe one of the... Uh, 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 glass half full, glass half empty. You decide. What about effects? What did you give it for effects? Uh, the effect it had on me or the effects of the movie? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, it's obviously a low budget, so like I wouldn't expect the effects to be good. I mean, there's a, a a couple times we get decent practical gore, I guess, but there's I don't know with effects, there's not a whole lot to go on. I think there's a charred, uh, crisp uh, skeletal body at one point that looked yep. okay. So I went with another five. A soundtrack, a five for effort because there was some song original written songs, I guess. Mm -hmm. And lastly, kills. I'm sticking on the five train nothing spectacular uh there was a uh, going along with the practical effects thing i said for the effects category i'm sticking with that that's what it gets the five for nothing more right which means that of a total of 50 points you give this movie 25 uh let's open this up uh david you can come in first here um anything you want to pick up on anything you want to reiterate or do you just want to jump to your scores <laughs> I mean, the only thing I will say is I I subjected myself to this twice, but <laughs> I will give credit that they did pull so many different, like, little things from so many post stories that, yeah, he's probably not happy that this was done, but I will give him credit to at least trying to do stuff like that and incorporating just little elements at least into what they're doing here. But yeah, this one is definitely for people that love that micro budget cinema type stuff. Right, uh, let's uh, swing down through your scores and see how the lineup with Mike's. Uh, what did you give the story? Uh, just because of pulling the elements from like the Telltale Heart, Usher, um, Annabelle Lee, and like the Black Cat, just kind of pulling all that stuff in and able to at least mesh it into something, I gave it a four. Right, so that's one below what Mike gave it. What did you give the acting? Uh, the acting, just because nobody is professional here, I didn't want to be too harsh but i still we had to give it a below average score of a three so that's two below mike what did you give the effects um there was a couple things here and there the other one that i also wanted to bring up was the eyeball thing that mm -hmm. we kind of start out with here i thought that was actually pretty well done but i still came in with a three so that is two below mike um what did you give the soundtrack the soundtrack there were a few different times where the music playing i could like you don't necessarily hear a lot with it, but I could still like feel it and it made me uncomfortable. So I came in with a five. Right. That's the same as Mike. And then lastly, kills. Uh, kills. Again, there was a couple things here and there that were decent. So I gave it a three just because there's not a whole lot of them though. 
right, that's two below Mike. Thank you very much. Lacey is like Lacey is screaming at her device in silence at the moment. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to her. Lacey, anything that you want to pick up on you? Anything that anyone has said at all here that may, may be wrong? Uh, you guys are all far too fucking generous. <laughs> That's the hangover speaking, Lacey. That's the hangover oh, speaking. No, no. This movie would have gave me a hangover <laughs> if I didn't have one. Um, yeah, this movie made me feel stupid. Like, I literally felt dumber having watched it. Um, I, like, I know I said that, like, Wreck wasn't my shit. This mm. is definitely not my shit. <laughs> like... Um, I just don't find it funny. I don't find it cute or clever. I, I like, I find it offensive to be honest with you. <laughs> like, um, it just, it's really like, if it's your thing, cool. It's definitely not mine. Um, yeah, it was a struggle. This one was a fucking struggle. Um, let's, let's see how you're like, cause some people have said some things and then we've got to the scores and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about because these scores feel like. They don't reflect that. Let's see how your scores reflect what you've just said. What did you give the story? A negative motherfucking 10! <laughs> um, I would if I could, but no, um, a 1. <laughs> you give a 1. <laughs> it was so stupid. It's so stupid. It's, that's a 4 below what might give it. Um, acting? It's fucking stupid. Like, <laughs> this required no effort whatsoever. It just was a group of people getting together to, like, make a stupid fucking movie it's a one it's four below mike what did you give the effects what fucking effects <laughs> um i give it a fucking one it's four below mike soundtrack oh god like you didn't talk up at least it. once during this movie no no this movie was fucking <laughs> dumb duncan i literally like felt like my brain was going to explode with how stupid it was like it there's like nothing like I like I like don't even want to review this movie. Like, it's a one. <laughs> it's a one, right? And lastly, kills. Come on, I mean, kills. No, it's fucking stupid. Like it's not horror. It's horrible. It's like the fucking mummy costume. Like like it's just so stupid. Like it's like I like I'm I'm not like the biggest fan on like spoof shit. Anyways, I mean like I like scary movie, but even those got dumb as they went on. And I'm, like, not even a fan of really, like, Mel Brooks type stuff. Like, mm. it just, like, spoofs. It's not my thing, you know? So, this, like, I thought, like, I hated zombies. I fucking hate this shit even more. So, um, yeah, it's a one. <laughs> Which means <laughs> maximum of 50 points. Uh, Lisa, you gave this a five. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. That's uh, being generous. <laughs> Let's go to our last commentator, um, Tyler. Uh, w like I'm looking at you, you're n you are somewhere in between David and Lacey, and not as generous as Mike. Um, what you got to say? Well, <laughs> this movie. <laughs> so it's funny you gave us like the tidbit at the beginning of how this movie came to be, because mm. as I'm watching this. I'm, I felt like this movie feels like they're like somebody in like a local like drama theater club got a new camcorder and brought it. it was like let's make a movie guys and then they literally just made it like then their little club just made a movie where everybody got a part with using whatever props they had on hand mm. in like whatever locations like people would let them shoot this movie was just like a random ball and nothing yeah <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of generous uh, sometimes to experimental stuff, but sometimes I think people give movies credits like for just because they're experimental and just because it's experimental uh, doesn't mean it's good. Uh, I, I would if he wasn't in the movie himself, like I would have never believed the guy that made the Devils and Woman in Love also made this movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, it just like it, it just felt like they were just like. Like, oh, let's, what can we do with these props? And then they just, like, would go in, like, a room and, like, shoot whatever they did. Like, everything was, like, improv. No one ever knew what they were doing. And, like, there's a little novelty at first. Like, okay, well, this is weird. Well, this is goofy. And it's, like, there's nothing to actually fall here. There's not a story. I'm not gonna... This movie, just, this movie doesn't have that. But I got, like, at the point where I was like, all right, all right. I, I think I've seen enough of this. I went to check the time, and I was, like, barely halfway <laughs> 
I, like, I couldn't believe that I, this was like, oh man. So once you saw, once I saw that, it just <laughs> it wore off. This was like a weird video you find on YouTube that you think is kind of weird and funny and show your friends. That's like 13 minutes long, stretched into 82 minutes. So yeah, this movie is uh is 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 pretty terrible. There's there's not much to yep. not much to go with. I'm gonna go ahead and punch the low hanging fruit like a speed bag. I I do lo- I do love the fact you said you were a notorious low grader. Yet you've scored this higher than Lacey. <laughs> yeah, I mean I've seen some movies definitely worse than this. Right. Let's let's <laughs> yeah. let's, let's let's lean in on those grades. Then what did you give the story? Uh the story I gave a one. Right, so that's four below what Mike gave it. Acting? Acting, I gave it two. That's three below Mike. Uh, effects? I gave it two. That is three below Mike. Soundtrack? I gave the soundtrack a three. Yeah, you, you, you could tap your toe to this. That's the you know that's that's not bad. That's two below Mike. And then lastly, kills. I gave the kills a two. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, which was three below Mike, uh, out of a maximum of 50, you gave this movie a 10. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I would like to thank Mike for his uh, his review of this movie. He is now free to step down. But we're now getting to the crucial bit right now. We are now talking about overall scores from the hosts collectively. So, uh, here we go. Um, so, let's start at the, the very top. Lord of Illusions uh, collectively scored all together. Um, scored a maximum, this is out of 200, uh, got 119 points. Um, Creepy, out of a maximum of 200 points, got 149. Nightbreed, out of a maximum of 200, got 140. And The Fall of the Louse of Usher, inexplicably, got 58 out of 200. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, if we're looking at the scores here, swinging in! At the top spot, um, should be no surprise to anyone because I called it. Uh, number one spot is Creepy with 149. The second place, Nightbreed with 140. Lord of Illusions coming in at third place with 119. And The Fall of the Louse of Usher coming in at the bottom place with 58. Now, I know the people out there are saying, Duncan, you said you scored these. Let's see how far off the mark he scored these overall. So allow me to... I'll let you peek behind the curtain to my scores as well. Uh, Lord of Illusions, uh, which was the first movie reviewed here. I actually scored this movie second from the bottom. I gave it a total of 28 points. Um, a lot of this stuff has already been mentioned. I think it is a colossal missed opportunity, especially if you've read the source material. Interesting concept. It's kind of like a, it's like a, a magical angel heart, but without all the charm, wit, and acting. Um, so yeah, it gets twenty eight points. Um, I scored creepy exactly the same as the reviewer who took point on this one. Me and Lacey locked in on this. Lacey, I I found that when it comes to scoring movies. Um, Weirdly, me and you are very alike on our scores for the movies that you've actually been allocated. So we both scored the maximum, well, the highest marks that we could have to Stoker. And I'm with you on this episode as well on Creepy. It got 39 points from me. Uh, Nightbreed uh, was my second favourite movie overall. It got 38 points, one lower than what Lacey gave it. But the second highest score overall, I'm one of those ones that grew up with this movie. So it really is my, it's my bag, baby. Um, and then lastly, I uh, was the second, sorry, third lowest score um, on the fall of the Louse of Usher. Uh, I gave this one a 15 point total out of 50. Uh, yeah, <laughs> fucking rough. Uh, which means collectively overall, actually nothing changed, including my scores. They all remain the same. The only difference is that between Creepy and Nightbreed, um... That that was shortened just briefly in, in terms of the overall scores. So yeah, Creepy still remains at the top with 188, Nightbreed with 178, Lords of Illusion 147, and The Fall of the Louse of Usher at 73, which might be, and it'll be interesting to see how we get to the end, I think that will be the lowest scoring movie overall of the entire season. So <laughs> it's a fucking terrible movie. So there you go. Um, let's see who called it right though. Believe it or not, every single person on this recording 
scored creepy either their highest or joint highest movie overall um so yeah you all called it right and then looking across the board here nightbreed was your second favorite movie across the board or joint first um then it was lord of illusion so we're kind of following suit here and everyone scored with their lowest score the fall of the laws of usher so unlike episode number one everyone was completely aligned with the overall scores at the end a huge thank you to my hosts for joining me on this episode uh, they have already told you where you can check out their stuff please go forth and support them on the internet with the, the the podcast they have tons of great quality content out there with loads of episodes as well which will keep you tidying over until the next one of these drops lastly all that is left for me to say is thank you very much to my guest hosts and to you the listeners for checking out this episode another one of these episodes will be dropping for you very very soon episode number three sees uh, a plethora of awesome movies a return of some of the hosts you've already heard some of the ones are from this episode and some some new voices as well so wherever you are whatever the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours please take care of yourselves out there this is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs and I am signing off <laughs>